23DB Production Studios in the Garden State, New Jersey, this is the Art of Music Tech with your hosts, Fela and Dennis. Let's go, let's go, let's go, and welcome to the Art of Music Tech podcast. I'm your host, Fela, and over there is Dennis. Hi, everybody. And our guest today, Wake Anderson of Soundbridge. Hello, the, hello, hello. The fantastic free DAW system that just kills the game right now. Thank oh, you so much. Right. I just want to say thank you. Oh, thank you. Because <laughs> um, if you complain about not having the right gear, the right software, yada, 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 you, you couldn't have looked at Soundbridge. You, you you can't know of this place yet because they are now killing the game between the DAW system and their verbs and just the technology in general that you guys are bringing. Um, wait, let's talk. Let's do it. All right. <laughs> uh, yes. You're the founder yes. of SoundBridge. Let, let's go through the story of that. Okay. So I started developing, um, well, I guess writing out, sketching on a piece of paper, designs for just user interfaces for potential, you know, plugins and, you know, DAW interfaces that I thought would be more concise and consolidated than anything I was seeing in the market. I guess this was when I was a junior at Northeastern University in Boston. Okay, what year? Were that we was about? Uh, 2013. 2000, well, I started doing these sketches around 2012, but then we started making moves around the end of 2013. Who we? Right. Did you have partners already? No, no. Um, no, I mean, just myself. And then the, uh, obviously the support of, you know, my family and, and the people around me. All right. Okay. All right. And um, what was the thought process when you, to even do these sketches yep. in, in 2013? Like, yeah. was there something that happened? You were like, damn it, I'm going to come up with something to yeah. do this, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I started playing guitar when I was 10 years old, and I started taking the music theory um, extremely seriously in high school, and I began writing my own music. And then when I entered college in around 2009, um, I got my first MacBook because they had a big sale for students, and they had student discounts and stuff. And then I started experimenting with GarageBand. And within my first day of experimenting with GarageBand, I was able to get my first song fully recorded. And I just taught myself multi-tracking and all of that in essentially 24 hours. And I was like, "Oh my God, this Dang. is actually this is actually really <laughs> this is actually really easy." Um, so I kept doing it, and then it, you know, eventually I hit a ceiling in GarageBand yeah. because I'm not sure if they've opened it up to VSTs yet. But um, audio uh, units, maybe they only had audio units back then, right? Yeah. Um, I don't. I think when I was using it, it was just whatever came with GarageBand because they're trying to upsell you to Logic. Oh, Built-in stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, it was limited too, right? Yeah. I think they've opened it up. They might have opened it up a little bit. They might accept VSTs now. But when I was using it, um, they didn't. Yeah. And um, I think it's because they had Logic, which did accept VSTs and had more professional features and stuff. And then I and that was when I was going to. I was actually I spent my first year in college in Susquehanna. Um, uh, in Pennsylvania, and uh, after that, I transferred to Northeastern University, and then I had a buddy at Northeastern that had Reason, and then I started experimenting with Reason, and I got in. That's the kind of turning point where I got into electronic music. I was experimenting with music synthesis, mm -hmm. and um, I was heavily, heavily into that. I actually, kind of put guitar down, you know, for a little bit just to kind of delve you know, more deeply into music synthesis, sequencing, recording, MIDI, and all that technology, uh -huh. right? Because it takes just as long to get to master that stuff than it does <laughs> to, the, play the, to play, play guitar, yeah. right? It's exactly. still a skill set, yeah. Yeah, and I really like the Reason workflow, and I thought the Reason environment was very good for beginners that had no prior exposure to hardware or might not have access to the hardware because of all the you know, the virtual patching and stuff like that. And I remained in Reason for quite a while um, until I just started to come to the conclusion that there's certain sounds that you can't make in Reason that are becoming, you know, obviously hits or whatever that uh, that only the VST market was, was supplementing. And, you know, of course, yeah. you know, when Skrillex came out and 
um, you know, obviously massive from Native Instruments was just blown Big, up. Big, yeah. You know, it was like a huge synthesizer and stuff like that. So then I started experimenting with Ableton and some of the other DAWs, and I found the transition to be very hard. You know, between, you know, I started rewiring Reason into Ableton to kind of slowly kind of wean myself off of Reason. And um, I guess as I got more and more into it, and I also started, you know, uh, making friends with people that were that were, that were better than me, um, you know, uh, we I started to see that, you know, when it comes down to the professionals that, that utilize it, less is more. <laughs> and, 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 and you know what I mean? Like, like less is more. And, um, <laughs> you know, I just started wondering, like, how much of this low level stuff can we get rid of and just, you know, keep the interface clean and simplify. Yeah. And keep it up to that 95 percent that does the job. And of course, if you need any, you know, anything for that one use case scenario, you know, that you don't hit in five million years. Right. Mm -hmm. Or on any blue moon. Uh, Preferably, the, the VST market would, would probably have a solution to supplement that if you absolutely needed it, and they typically do. Um, so, yeah, we just wanted to build something that was clean, and another, another thing that, that inspired me around the time that I started designing you know, the interface was that um, Stephen Slate had come out with the Raven, I think, around... Touchscreen? Yeah, the touchscreen. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time I saw, you know, like hardware emulation, but people like kind of touching it. So that was kind of an inspiration um, when we were first beginning. And then of course, my uh, Windows 8 came out and now every laptop was also a tablet. So we wanted to be, so we saw an opportunity to be, well, why don't we be the first DAW designed from the ground up for, you know, uh, multi-touch for Windows. And you only had, at the very beginning, you only had Windows support, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and essentially what I saw Stephen Slate doing is he was building a hardware unit to accommodate Pro Tools. And I was like, well, why don't you just build the software that runs on any touchscreen? Exactly. You know? And um, I thought that was a smarter angle to go at. And um, that's exactly what we did. And Microsoft wrote an article that recognized this as the first DAW built from the ground up for Windows, like with that in mind at the very beginning, a lot of, I think, like, I think like Cakewalk, which I don't know if, I, I think they're not around anymore, I don't think, but I think that they had added some functionality on top of their software to accommodate the touchscreen environment. Uh -huh. But um, that was a major differentiation at the very beginning. And then, you know, after a while, we started to come to the conclusion that, you know, <laughs> The mouse and keyboard is probably here to stay <laughs> because yeah, because of like the amount of found detail. But it's nice to have, you know, the 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 scalable interface um, to be able to to do things to, to like so you can still take advantage of multi touch. Like I mean, we have hand gestures in SoundBridge now. Mm -hmm. um, wow. You know that that makes it e much easier to use with touch screens than anything. But that's kind of taking a side step to just us trying to, you know, be something that's seriously professional and clean and, and you know, just a good environment and, and a u unique experience and a unique interface. Um, but what aiming for mobile did for us was limit what we could put on the interface. So we had to make executive decisions as far as, well, if we add that feature, is it easy to touch with your index finger? And if it's not, if you can't touch it with your index finger, we're going to have to implement it in a way where you can, where there's a dialog pop up with like an easy way to scroll through the options. And by inherently building the interface with mobile in mind, we made the interface inherently intuitive. All right. So, you know, it was our main differentiation. And that kind of was the catalyst for building something that's highly professional but highly clean and highly intuitive and easy to learn. And um, from my experience and everyone that actually uses it, it's a super fast to use DAW. And, we, and, and when I designed it, I kind of took the best elements of what I found. Like I liked the block sequencing and reason. But what I didn't like about reason after a while is all the manual threading you would have to do in the environment with obviously the chaining of like for a simple side chain you have to drag a 
a wire across. A lot of and steps. I mean, like, you know a what I mean? Like, yeah. so there's a lot of time. Like, reason claims to be simple, and it is, um, I guess, when you're trying to learn synthesis from the ground up. But there's a lot of manual processes in reason that I saw could be cut. Obviously, I mean, just inherently, if you're trying to mimic hardware, I mean, hardware is like a physical thing, you know, so like, mm-hmm. yeah. so, yeah, so it, so I, I found personally that I was limited in reason after a while just because of all the manual uh, moving of the wires and then you have to, and if you forgot exactly what patch, like you have to go back and check and, you know, and yeah. if you have like a huge, and, and, on, and on the thing is you have to build every, every single freaking sound essentially from scratch and at the time they didn't provide VST support, but now they do. But um, I don't know. I, I I actually haven't used Reason in quite a while, so I can't really speak on that. But um, yeah, it was, just, it was just a lot of manual processes. And it kind of, the more manual processes that you have, the the less you're focused on actual, actual composition and arrangement. Mm-hmm. And coming from a songwriter's perspective, I've always um, kind of looked at the song, you know, the sum of all parts versus the low level details of like kind of like how the sound was created. Um, and I think a lot of the professionals think that way too. Um, and you know, we're, we we're kind of coming up along companies like splice that essentially you pay a $7 subscription and you have a huge selection of really good kick drums. I mean, I don't know how much time people want. I mean, it's nice to know how to make a good like nine Oh nine kick drum and how to polish it and stuff. But, um, it's good to know that so that you can make fine tune adjustments and stuff like this. But if you have a ba- sample bank of twenty thousand perfectly polished nine hundred nine yeah, nice. kick drums, then like, like the, the why dude. why make every Sweet. sound like you know what I mean? Like why make it? so? Um, I contacted like... Splice. I wish they would work with us. It'd be nice to have a little help widget like kind of <laughs> natively integrated within Soundbridge, so then you could just drag and drop your samples yeah. directly in. So, I don't All know right. if they listen to this. They might. Well, we'll try and tag them on this. Get this oh hell the yeah! Yeah, going. yeah. Uh, <laughs> but how? Uh, so when we first met you, we yeah. actually didn't meet you. We yeah. met your partners, uh, and you were Lumet back yeah. then. Uh, Windows based DAW. Mm-hmm. You didn't even have uh, Mac support. Yeah. So how did you make the transition from Lumet to Soundbridge, and what? Yeah, so was involved in that. So Lumet was just our very, very minimum value offering. Um, when we designed it, I mean, there's some things that I that I personally liked about Reason that I saw other dolls doing, but then I realized that they weren't that practical. Like, for example, like you know, having a light colored interface, right? Like having a light colored interface to me. It, at the time, it, it looked kind of elegant and stuff, but then it gets draining on the eyes, you know, and also mm-hmm. it, can, it, it can wear out your battery because the LEDs are sure. going and, you know. So it came with some, it, it was quite a learning process from Lumet going into the sound bridge, but um, we, we, we entered the world's largest startup accelerator. We got into the world's largest startup accelerator called Mass Challenge, which is based in the Seaport area of Boston. Mm. And we're surrounded by a lot of mentors, but one in particular, um, Enrique Levin from Mexico City, was just pretty much took us by his wing. And he's he's a serial entrepreneur. He has a lot of experience, you know, with bootstrap startups and has created several startups on his own and is really out there actively in the community. And now he's a he's a owner of uh, he, he's a, he's a minority owner of, of the software company, but he's also a majority owner of the education company, which I'll touch up on in, in a little bit, which is Soundbridge Academy, which is our music production school. We'll talk about that later. Mm-hmm. But um, we thought we had to go through a complete rebranding phase because we made, um, we we thought that this, our, the new changes that we're going to make to the software were going to be so different from Lumet um, that it required a new name and just a new rebranding altogether. And another thing about the name Lumet is... Um, that wasn't, I don't know. Every, when I say Lumet, the people think it's like, oh, it's a visual software. Like, oh, it's like it's like Photoshop, oh, right? Oh, wow. Yeah, so, like, huh. so we're kind of tossing around names. And, you know, I did some more research on, like, what makes a good trade name, right? And I, I came across this video on YouTube by a guy that was, he works for Google, and he was talking about, like, successful trade names, like Apple or YouTube, and how they typically consist of two syllables and how you need to have a flat design because, like, you can change the color of the design 
and you're not relying on gradients or three-dimensional objects or whatever. And I learned a lot about just like general, you know, branding and stuff. And so when I thought about SoundBridge, well, it hit all the, it's two, it's two syllables. And when you put the two words together, it has DB right in the center. <laughs> and I actually didn't see that. The graphic designer I was working with saw that, <laughs> and then he highlighted it in design. I'm like, dude, that's perfect, bro. Perfect. Like, perfect. <laughs> perfect. And, wow. and then and then he designed the level meter, which is like giving the middle finger to the industry. It's like, fuck you, we're coming wow. out. Wow. <laughs> hey, now we all know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Thank yeah. you. Everyone was thinking that, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah, okay, so, man. so we're like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. These are, yeah. So that yeah, that that was yeah. Sound bridge, yeah. yeah. I mean you have no doubt on where you're gonna go with that product yeah, that's audio based product. Yeah, that's that's so exactly. Right. <laughs> exactly. Interesting. Um, yeah. So that was that was fun. So um yeah, so we, we went through a revamp. We wanted we wanted to make the interface, you know, as inspiring as possible. I think like half half of making a good music software is making something that not only works and functions and is concise, easy to get your head around and use rapidly, in addition to making good sounds, all right? Like, it's mm -hmm. one thing to make good sound. I mean, like, the, the technology behind what makes a good sound, like, has been around for decades. Everyone knows that, you know, and, and we're still just recycling kind of the basic components and reconfiguring them in various ways. And it's just been recently that, you know, like a, like a software like, like Serum has come out and, oh, a wavetable, all right? You just take samples of an audio file over time and then you can shift between the different samples. You get these cool glitched out sounds and that's a mm -hmm. really good way to make these glitched out basses and, you know, these really angry, hard sounding things, right? Yeah. So it's when you look at this stuff, it's not so terribly, the technology is not so terribly complicated and the DSP is not so terribly complicated. But if you clutter your freaking interface with a million kajillion knobs and parameters it just becomes very impractical for musicians to utilize rapidly when they're in the music creation process and when i see you know there's a growing up in boston there's a there's a music production school called maven there and you know there's obviously a big inspiring push for kids to get in the music production and they're all leaning towards like this minimal house sound right mm -hmm. like you know the minimal house sound right you know what i'm yeah. talking about oh, and yeah. and the minimal house sounds like it's it's good, but it's it's very minimal to me. Yeah. And um, I don't know. It, it, I see kids just getting too freaking confused with the, with the parameters, and they end up over compressing <laughs> their their wow. mid, or like you know, and like. I guess like John Hopkins style, like almost like that downbeat stuff. Like yeah, it's not a lot going on. I mean, the people that don't... do it good are oh, good. Yeah, well, yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Exactly. I'm not. I'm not. But, but they don't have. A bunch of stuff on there. They're, they're going through key channels and yeah. key synths and yeah. compress. You know, when they do do some compression, yeah, it's yeah, like it's from the heaviest gear on the market yeah. at the best. Yeah, you know, and it's just like you know, like like when when you're when you're given everything <laughs> all all at once, <laughs> it's like, well, where do you begin? It's like, oh, that parameter is there. Should I use it? It's like it's looking at me like, should I should I touch it? And I. I see a lot of kids like touching. But they don't know it yet, right? Yeah, and I mean, like you got. I mean, you got to read. You got to read the manual and have some understanding. But um, less is usually more, and a lot of that low level functionality, like you really, you know, don't need to touch it other than on like a blue mm. moon. And if you do need to touch it, it's it's real. It's useful for that one case. But you know, it just depends on the sound source and how clean the sound source is from the very beginning. You know, mm -hmm. and then if you're trying to build you know, all your sounds and make the music all in one process. Oh, damn. No. Like, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. like uh, I know you play guitar. It's like yeah. seeing a guitar amp with just uh, a gain knob, a guitar amp. I've seen guitar, two guitar amps that just had a volume knob. That's it. No EQ, no verb, no nothing. Just one volume knob. That's yeah. I mean, it. if the tone, if the tone that comes out the other end is, is high caliber and, exactly. and, and, and works, I mean, you know, um, I mean, obviously, you need some minimal functionality, you know, to to make edits and make it and make it clean and make it, mm -hmm. you know, um, there. Or you know, if you you know, it's good to know synthesis to the point where you can edit, you know, an existing patch that's kind of like halfway there to make it gel at your mix, or you can build something from scratch. But you know, um, that just comes from a lot of trial and error. You know, you have to really learn. I mean, like with all these electronic genres and stuff like that, there's 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 things that work and there's things that don't work and 
um, a lot about staying within the genre is doing the exact same thing everyone else is doing. Because if you ever go to a rave, like the the rave just keeps the same music kind of going like all the time. So if you bring anything new into that mix, it just drains everyone's <laughs> yeah. life. It just, it just kills the vibe. It just kills oh, yeah, the yeah. vibe. You know what I mean? So yeah. like you, you got to keep the same tempo and the same, you know, and it's awesome and stuff. But like, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, but, a lot of side chain stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a lot. Like, yeah, I mean, music. music. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That that's utilized in Soundbridge. Yeah. That you, yeah, I mean, you really are. It, is it based towards the electro community, or I mean, even though, like we said, we, we've used it on our podcast. Yeah. We've used Soundbridge. You can yeah, use it in whatever, record whatever audio way media. you want to. But the the EDM commu- community is yeah. really uh, rallying behind Soundbridge. It sounds like as well, right? Yeah, yeah. We're we're very well accepted in the side trance community, in particular from Europe. And yeah. I guess the what I've always thought is, you know, if it satisf- if it satisfies the electronic people then it should satisfy everyone in between because they're using 100% of, of they're making the music with 100% software. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. So, I've they always are like all up in it. Yeah, so I'm <laughs> like if, if 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 the if the EDM crowd is happy, then it has enough audio processing technology for for, you know, the audio recording and, and you know, traditional musicians that need it for, you know, recording and stuff like that. Record an acoustic guitar. Yeah, and acoustic. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. So that's just kind of like what I've always thought. And also because like you need to have like a certain, um, you know, like if you're if you're making electronic music, you'll get into songs because like all the electronic music needs to be like eight minutes long. Like when, when, you, when you release like a side trance si- uh, single, the sing- like the side trance song has to be eight minutes. And if you're doing something that's really pushing the boundaries and you're changing up the vibe of the song like every eight bars, um, then you end up with these projects that are like 200 tracks plus long, and um, the software's got to be able to handle that. Yes. yes. And a lot of these guys like to keep it in MIDI so that it can, so that they can edit it and make changes to it instead of like balancing it. So, Soundbridge, you know, from my personal experience, you know, making this type of music, yeah, Soundbridge can handle up to 150, 200 tracks all MIDI without balancing. That's yeah. powerful. It's yeah. powerful. Wow. Yeah. Um, I think we're just we're gonna end right here. Yeah. Um, but back. we're coming back yeah. with, with Wake Anderson on part two about Soundbridge Academy and more info about this software. amazing software, Soundbridge. Uh, again, thank you guys for listening. Uh, please share. Um, we're on all the the we're on all the platforms. Yeah, platforms is what I'm looking for. (laughs) iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Podbean, YouTube, uh, YouTube, rather. Uh, Thanks again from Fela, from me, Fela, Dennis, Dennis and Wake Anderson. Uh, You can check him out. What is it? Soundbridge.com? No, it's uh, soundbridge.io, www.soundbridge.io for the software. And if you're interested in our music productions, Uh, academy that's www.soundbridgeacademy.com all right we'll be back with wake on the next episode one more thing uh yes on the next episode we'll be giving your listeners a uh special offer towards our soundbridge academy so stay tuned for that please do let's go let's go for more information of booking 23db productions visit their website at 23dbproductions.com Like and follow 23DB Productions at Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter for the latest work.